Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Zach Seward. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Quartz, global business news organization at uh, QC.com. Them. Our topic today is the rise and fall of the great powers. Um, we definitely could have, should have, maybe did have a version of this uh, panel a year ago, but I think it, it may take a different form um, now that we're uh, we're speaking of of it a, a, a year plus into the global pandemic. Um, some nations have fiery ends, as with Rome burning, but for many, it is sim simply a gradual slip into obscurity. Businesses are exhorted to engage with creative destruction, but will this be too nerve wracking for a nation and its people? How do nations become and retain their power status? Do they reinvent themselves over time? How will the US and China balance their undoubted talents? So we'll try to hit on as many of those themes uh, as we can uh, today and um, welcome your questions uh, as well. I'm going to let the, uh, each of our panelists introduce themselves as they answer uh, the first question, and um, which uh, is which I'd like to start by focusing on what to me and, and I think to many of those of uh, of, the, of us on the, on today's panel is the number one threat to today's great powers, uh, which is not being uh, replaced by another great power, um, but the existential threat of climate change. Um, I, uh, you know, a number of our panelists work directly um, on, uh, on on climate resilience. Uh, Christina will start, you know, in particular, you know, uh, has has done a lot of work in sustainable investing. What I'd love to hear from each of you um, is it what is keeping you hopeful um, at this moment? What's what new development in your the area you follow is is perhaps making you a little bit more hopeful? at this moment um, that we might be able to turn back the, the threat of climate change and, and, and make progress um, uh, at, at avoiding that, the, you know, what had, had started to seem like a, you know, a truly inevitable uh, uh, an existential threat. Christina? Uh, so just quick, Christina Alfonso, um, I'm the ESG Senior Advisor to Simbria Capital. And to answer the question, um, you know, what, it, what keeps me hopeful, um, I think greater awareness, greater, um, fortunately, uh, supported by uh, social media and other forms of uh, information transfer, we're uh, much more aware of the circumstances in which we're living and what these existential challenges are. Felix? Thanks, Zach. Um, and, you know, it is a broad topic, but a fascinating topic at the same time. Just quick background. Um, I've spent uh, well over 10 years running and building up uh, a European fund focused on climate change solutions, um, so technologies and renewable energy projects. And then over the last seven years, switched over to uh, investing in what we call frontier markets, so really early stage, difficult markets. But frankly, very similar issues come up, obviously, how to reduce poverty and how to build up companies, but also, you know, what can be done on on energy solutions that help uh, reduce poverty and at the same time does something good to the world. And it's interesting, you know, in the middle of Kandahar, there's a 30 megawatt solar project at the moment up and running and producing energy every single day. And you read in the press, you know, shooting around Kandahar on a daily basis. The power is being produced as we speak. You know, these little examples are, are great to see. Um, and, you know, obviously other countries in the region are fascinating as well. I'm sure we get to that later. Uh, for sure. Uh, Lord Way? Hi there, yes. Uh, well, I work in uh, our parliament here in the UK but I'm also an advisor to a sustainable investment uh, platform called Future Planet Capital. Uh, and uh, I'm involved in various companies, including ones involved in blockchain, which I know we'll talk about later. And we've had uh, a tremendous year working on, uh, uh, working with uh, backing a company that's behind the Oxford vaccine. 
which as you know is rolling out around the world and i'm i'm hopeful because as you know many countries including britain have uh resources that may not be the biggest or the you know the the might not be the largest but i think it we've been able to show and other countries have been able to show that with a bit of nimbleness and agility we can quickly find some solutions so on the back of that i think you know certainly we're looking and have been investing in sustainable solutions and of course the challenge for the world and for countries is how to scale up um the, an area that i'm excited about but cautiously i have to have some caution because it's been a long journey is about hydrogen and how can we use algae to generate hydrogen in a decentralized and centralized manner you know re reusing some of the assets in petrochemical industry uh just it was my kids watching one of our royal uh, institute lectures and learnt that in the last billion years it was algae that saved us uh so i'm wondering whether there's something in that that we need to uh, to double down on uh any reading on the topic you'd recommend for uh, if anyone wants to dig into algae as a uh, potential solution uh, yeah it, uh... so if you can get hold of the royal Le royal christmas lectures at the royal institute uh, I recommend mm -hmm. uh watching those. Um and then there are a number of startups out there working on algae to food or algae to hydrogen solutions uh and and some of the videos that they're producing are are fascinating. The the challenge is how to how to enable them to continuously make hydrogen rather than uh, a lot of the current solutions it's that the yield is limited because of interactions of oxygen and and mm. uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Stan? Thank you. Um, so nice to be here and great to see all of you. Um, I work in what I would think of as existential tech across a wide range of areas. Um, but climate has been at the center of a lot of what we do because it is, as you said, Zach, uh, kind of the biggest overarching issue that we all face. And in, in a way, it is an existential threat. I think there's really three areas that are coming to bear on it. One um, that all essentially give me hope. Um, one is the idea of coming to net zero. So companies and even countries need to get to net zero carbon emissions. And for a long time, we didn't really know how to do that. But over the last several years, work has been done to both, you know, figure out where the biggest areas of carbon emissions are with like Project Drawdown and Paul Hawkins' work, uh, as well as like groups like One Earth who have created maps of like the most important bioregions around the world. There's a, a listing of 52 bioregions, which are the most important that we need to save. And so in a weird way, this is kind of coming down to data. It's companies being able to know what they're doing from a carbon perspective. It's countries knowing what they're doing. And then it's being able to eight minute energy, which are now down to three cents a kilowatt hour for contracts um, to the city of Los Angeles. So energy is becoming free. And if you talk to those solar CEOs, they say that eventually energy will become a service as opposed to something that you're paying for based on the quantity that you have. So if we can get to theoretically free energy through solar or wave or algae, then I think we have a, a chance to kind of turn the tide. But on the other side, um, we have to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, three to four degrees Fahrenheit in order to affect or avoid runaway climate change. And the unfortunate thing is that it does not look like we're on track to do that. And so warmer temperatures and pretty strong series of adaptation is almost certain to be needed. No, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, to be clear that, uh, Started off with a with a with a more positive bent on the question, but don't intend to be Pollyannish about the threat. There, uh, I'd love to talk in, our, in the next round of questioning about um, uh, about more serious implications. Uh, but last up in this round, uh, Gary, if you could introduce yourself. Stan, I mean, I loved what you had to say about net zero, what we're doing, and why. Right um, from my perspective, my background is building companies and then advising administrations and frontier markets on how to use economic instruments of power. Um, 
So, you know, at the highest level, a, a lot of the organizing principle, to your point, Stan, is around economic transformation. How do we get more innovation? How do we figure out the regulation? How do we do this, you know, better, faster, stronger, quicker? Because, you know, China's civil military fusion, if you then take it down a level, is about 100,000 times better than what we're doing right now. Um, and so what, in at least in my opinion, from an economic lens, what we need to be looking at is what capitalism looks like in the 21st century versus the way we're going, which is more of a form of, of statism that's only going to get us in the mud further. Thanks for the questions there. Sure, I'll come back around to you to get to hear more about uh, what that picture looks like uh, to you. All right. Uh, well, um, we'll uh, we'll keep going, but just want to note we've got uh, you know folks in the audience. Thank you for joining us. If you've got any questions of your own as we're going, please feel free to to throw them in a small enough crowd which should be able to uh, to get to um, to get to them. And we'd love to make sure the sessions as useful for you uh, as as possible. But in any event, uh, welcome and please you know make yourself comfortable. The I, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, not with, notwithstanding what progress we're able to make in, in beating back some of the effects of climate change, it's, it's clear that, um, you know, that, that uh, some st still other effects are inevitable and will no doubt have pretty dramatic uh, impacts on, on the way um, we all live and on particular parts of the world. And Felix, I, I love it if you could take us, through what you feel are the biggest geopolitical sh changes we should expect to happen um, as um, as climate change progresses, um, and you know, so you know where um, where the most dramatic shifts in power uh, are, are most are most likely to occur. Yeah, that's an even bigger question than the previous ones. Excellent. <laughs> um, Look, I think one of the key things we need to remember, and I'm now thinking about what we call frontier markets, which usually are really poor countries coming out of wars, having been in difficulties. Um, and if we just take a few examples, uh, and maybe I'd start with the region I know probably best, which is South and Central Asia. Um, a country like Afghanistan obviously has gone through enormous difficulties over the last four decades, if not longer. Um, and whenever... Um, you know, I'm, I'm there and I'm there regularly um, and it's snowing outside. People think, oh, good, we're going to have a good crop this year. So that immediate connection between it's snowing in Kabul or anywhere else where I might be and the knowledge, OK, we will have enough water resources for the summer and, uh, and for harvest season. And obviously agriculture is a huge uh, area for a country like Afghanistan. When that connection breaks because of climate change, we'll have a totally different situation than we currently have. And it's currently difficult enough. I don't know whoever follows the press at the moment, uh, peace negotiations going on between the US and Russia and China and Pakistan and a few Afghans as well about the Afghan peace uh, process. But when you then take climate change into that, things look totally different. Look at Pakistan expectations are half the population will be in water distressed uh, uh, areas living there that's 100 million people and you can broaden that that remit uh, quite substantially and you will see that climate change could have catastrophic um, consequences for the political stability of these already incredibly fragile states um, maybe just one other example when you look up in uzbekistan where obviously there have been living off uh, the cotton industry for, for decades and obviously ruined the, the environment as a result of that in, in many parts of the country and the wider region. They had and have had to look at what else can we do. Fortunately, they found a lot of interesting new opportunities, regional trade, some natural, uh, other natural resources, technology coming in. I visited you know, a super modern Samsung um, production facility in the middle of Tashkent where you think you're in South Korea, but no, you're in the middle of Tashkent and they're exporting that across the entire region. So new technologies are also coming up there and providing opportunities for growth. Great, thank you. Uh, Christina, I, I, you do a lot of work in sustainable investing and you know, no, I, I, for sure, of course, a, you know, a key consideration there is the impact that companies have on 
the environment. But I, I feel feel like the my sense is it's still a pretty nascent area in terms of establishing standards for uh, measuring the impact that um, that the, the companies have on the environment, and and for the maturity of ESG investing as a whole. Um, may, it could be that this turns out to be a breakout year for uh, for ESG. I don't, it certainly seems like anecdotally it seems uh, like I, I hear a lot more uh, about it. But I'm more curious from your perspective if that's um, if that's the case. <laughs> if, uh, if those anecdotes um, ring true to you, and um, and and then you know what what impact uh, rise of, of of ESG funds could could have in in, in combating a climate crisis. Yeah. So just taking it back to the the broader topic, you know, great powers, great powers are generally defined by two key characteristics, their economies and their military. Um, And, you know, originally we were talking about the comparison between the U.S. and China, but clearly our panel is 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 touching on um, how far reaching this is internationally. And so um, I think, you know, whether or not it's a breakout year, um, however that's defined for ESG, I think what we're dealing with uh, at this point is just an understanding of a greater a sense of urgency for us to address um, the climate crisis uh, and efficient allocation of capital, whether it's at the corporate level, whether it's directed by boards, um, whether it's directed by governments, um, clearly, the, the COVID crisis is going to have a significant impact on um, government bu- budgets and government's ability to, you know, put capital to work in other areas. In the United States, um, you know, it's unfortunate that we have some really suffering infrastructure that needs to be addressed, um, m- military infrastructure as well. Um, so this is going to erode, um, you know, our ability to uh, be a global leader. Uh, if we if these are things we cannot address, and then imagine if if we're talking about this in the context of U.S. and China, where countries like Afghanistan sit in this equation. So, um, so I think yes, I, I no longer think of it in the context of traditional investing versus sustainable or ESG investing. I just think everyone needs to sort of wake up to the reality that we're all contributing to the problem and have the ability to potentially contribute to a solution, and, and that requires public private partnership across the board. Well, but what what more would it require? Because I mean, I, I, what it, the incentives need to be there, no doubt, to uh, encourage to to encourage those kind of partnerships you're talking about. And, and I think it's fair to say the private sector has made some progress, but um, but it's been slow going. What would need to change? It has uh, generally su- supportive legislation. The UK, uh, I'm sure Lord Way can touch on this, but uh, the UK is certainly outpaced the United States in, in supportive legislation uh, and taxation that would uh, enable people to be motivated uh, to to put capital to work in this area. Um, that's sort of the, the the quickest thing that I can think of to to put that capital. Yeah, no, it's a great answer, and actually, I'll I'll take your cue. If, if, is that something you can speak to, Lord Way? UK legislation um, and to uh, incentivize a bit greater environmental responsibility among companies. Uh, we may have, I think uh, we have an opportunity as a country that's come out of Brexit uh, to make use of our newfound freedoms to legislate uh, in a in a positive way towards net zero, as well as to uh, support entrepreneurs as we do to innovate and to come up with new technologies and and to sort of uh, have a more agile governance system and regulation system on on everything from fintech as well as on climate change and, and innovation more broadly. So this is a pretty powerful, exciting time in the UK for us uh, in terms of supporting uh, these changes. The, the key is we need to partner with others to scale the solutions that are emerging. Uh, you know, so we need to kind of continue to be uh, a global player with our partners East and West. Yeah, I mean, it would seem, it would seem actually a, like a uh, specific kind of problem that would benefit from uh, uh, it, uh, multinational coalition, but, uh, but I, I, like the US, there are, there are ways to go it alone. Um, Gary, I wanted to come, 
back to you is if it is shift uh, a topic of conversation um, as a preview at the top to touch on blockchain, you, you sort of teased in the big in the intro uh, an alternative vision um, for a capitalist system or post-capitalist system that uh, I'd love, love if you could um, elaborate on and might lead us into next next area of discussion. Yeah, Zach, thanks. Uh, I, I'm just going to build on what Christina said because she hit the, the spot, you know, she hit the spot perfect. Strategic overmatch in the 21st century from the highest level is less and less about military power and it's more about economic instruments of power. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, the, the folks in D.C., whether that's in the Intel, defense or security points of view, they're still looking at geopolitics and increasingly what matters is geoeconomics. And uh, until DC decides to wake up, until uh, universities like Harvard uh, and Stanford start looking at this more strategically in their uh, board director classes, not their MBA classes, and uh, as we institutionalize that level of education, we're not gonna see that high level structural shift. And to be honest with you, we're not even gonna be having the right conversations because we're going to have a Ferrari with three broken wheels. And that's essentially what's going on right now is everybody wants to move forward, but nobody wants to talk about the underbelly. And we can go all the way back even to 2008, the fact that we covered up most of the, the structural inefficiencies in our finance and monetary policies globally within the five eyes. And so I agree with Lord Way, right? It, it is the five eyes. It's looking at how do we do things together and collaborate at a, at a bigger standard. There's no better economic growth engine than, than capitalism. That's been proven over and over. But how we get the state out of the way to understand that we're at the last stage of capitalism, the last stage of democracy and the last stage of empire, but still are able to mitigate against climate change, mitigate against, you know, threats from other adversaries. That's ultimately the larger question that I think we're not having in a geoeconomic sense with a military second. Instead, we're still sitting here talking about military and thinking, you know, our special ops or five eyes on the intel side are going to solve things. And we're magically going to you know, wake up in 10 years and be able to figure this out in five years because we're not. And, and I think Christina can speak to that. And I know uh, Felix already did. Um, and I know some of the other panelists, particularly on the blockchain type of thing. These are some of these innovative tools and technologies that can get us further, faster, better. that can help us leapfrog where we are now. But the institutionalization of these things, and I'd love to hear from the other panelists what they think. Uh, we're just not there yet. Well, sure. I would stand. I'd love to hear a bit from you. Maybe give us the assessment of where, where in fact we are at. Well, it's a complicated question, and it's actually a very, very fast-moving question. You guys probably know that the, the the rage this week in the crypto space is something called NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens. Essentially, what NFTs do is allow you to put essentially identity or ownership for any type of object or asset onto the blockchain. But what it points to is really a wholesale rewrite of the financial system. And, you know, to, to the earlier points about the, this idea that there are um, geoeconomic versus geopolitical forces at work, what, what Gary just said, um, is true. But at the same time, there's also like an internal welling up that's happening within all of these countries of the next generation of youth and and kind of business talent, which are looking at the old citadels and trying to rewrite them. And that's very much happening in um, the world of crypto. And so what we're seeing is like an inside out rewrite of the financial system. And so that actually creates an existential threat to the U.S. because the U.S., since the 1950s or 60s has built the technology infrastructure for, um, you know, essentially control. You know, China, in a weird way, controls Bitcoin because of the way that Bitcoin is created and the fact that it demands energy and miners. And so as a multi-trillion dollar asset, the Chinese are really more in charge of Bitcoin than the West is at, at the moment, even though it's considered a decentralized technology. And then on top of that, the um, Chinese government has been investing heavily in a digital Belt and Road initiative, which is now really looking at blockchain for up to 44 countries. And the big focus there is supply chain. They're trying to reinvent the supply chain management side of things so they can control that. 
So you're seeing like, I think, real investment on the longer scale time horizons by China in that. On the other side, though, you do have levels of innovation and exploration that happen in the U.S. or the West that continually upend the whole system. And there is that capitalistic sense of evolution that I think is driving opportunity for the U.S. to remake it, remake itself. But according to a lot of the work out there, um, the money is still in the West and the new infrastructure is kind of coming from the East. And so it's going to be interesting to see how those things merge or, or meld together. But I do think eventually we're going to see an entirely parallel system. And because it's faster and more secure, it will eventually take over the old financial system. So that means that there's big opportunities for things to be rewritten um, from a power standpoint, whether you're a country like Bermuda, where I'm on the FinTech advisory board for that country, they were very early in reinsurance in the 80s. And because of that investment that they made then, they actually dominate the global reinsurance market from an island with 60,000 people. Well, today they're a leader in legislation around digital assets and crypto. And more than anyone, they're, you know, banking exchanges and things like that. So that they have a, a bigger than they should, theoretically, uh, footprint in the future. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's just a matter of um, who gets out there and kind of tackles it. Thanks, Dan. Sorry, I, um, my connection cut out there in the middle of your your answer. I, I, I caught uh, caught most of it. Um, well, it, it's a fascinating tension you're describing—a push and pull between sovereign states and uh, and, and, and blockchain-based finance. Uh, Lord Way is the closest to a representative of sovereign state um, among us. I, how, I'm curious how you see that playing out over the long run. I mean, obviously right now we're in a period of like, is this going to be a, a, a quite, a, quite a lot of regulatory decisions to make um, at a granular level, but at, at the long run, is there, is this a, a do, do, do you see it uh, coexisting? Um, do you, or, or do you buy any of, you know, Stan's um, argument that it is a, a, a threat to, um, to, to, to sovereign governments and, and, and sovereign finance? I mean, I think to build on, to start with the topic of, of today, uh, to zoom out a little bit and, and then zooming back into blockchain, I believe we are in a fall of Rome type scenario, post-war settlement. Uh, it's interesting, I've been researching this, Rome in the centuries it took, the Western Roman Empire, perhaps too big um, and that your system isn't necessarily sustainable. I don't think we are in a, in a to echo some of the views before, that we're in a nation state rivalry period, like the run up to the First World War. I think the, 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 the world we're in is about the last like climate events, like disruptive technology, cyber attacks. Um, so you don't necessarily have to attack another country today. You just have to be resilient to the attacks that hit you. And we've seen differences in the world in, in terms of responses. Now, if, if that is part of the criteria for winning as a country or as an organization or as an individual, that the, the more resilient win, not necessarily the one with the most resources, then, then you have to then kind of figure out, well, what is the system we need locally, nationally, you know, here in the UK, around the world, that would facilitate that resilience? And do we believe that the centralized model of resilience, so a national blockchain or a, or a kind of Lib liberal blockchain is the solution or do we think it's something else i think it has to happen at every level and i think countries will come up with their own versions too so it, i'm not ready to write off the country yet <laughs> as a model i think there are certain things a country can do you know it is a country is essentially the shared narrative for people around historically novels and the written word right so we're just seeing a world in which some people are still loyal to that some people are more loyal to their social media tribe and some people still believe in this post-war liberal, you know, model. Others are moving to another model, which is more of an author authoritarian model. 
And I think the jury's still out. I will say that the last time this happened, there was a new phenomenon that happened uh, as the empire fell, which I'm interested in, which is the monasteries. So these much smaller, nimble communities that try to salvage, you know, what's left of the old, but also innovate and create villages and communities. And I think there is an alternative. And if we can have coalitions of the good, by which I mean people who want to create nimble and yet powerful uh, use of these technologies, rather than coalitions of those who might use them for either uh, profit maximization only or political uh, power maximization purposes, I think there is a possibility of a different movement. Uh, but it's very hard to engineer these things. This has to happen somewhat spontaneously. Coalitions of the willing, if you like. We saw that with, with the post-war settlement. We can see it again today. But the jury's still out on where that's going to come from. And, and how the status quo will deal with that is, is, is the big question. I can't guarantee that the, monas the new monasteries of today will win with their versions of blockchain, you know, the, the Wikipedia type models of the future, whether they will win. But I think it's worth a try. What have we got to lose? And, and I think, like, just to add on to that, Lord Way, I don't think that the nation state is in an existential threat against the blockchain side. But what I do think is that these technologies are giving new tools to help nation states rewrite the balance of power. So if, for instance, China is able to launch a parallel financial system that uses blockchain technology, then that, you know, is is something that doesn't exist today and affects the balance of power between these different things. On the other hand, you know, I'm a big believer in cooperation. And as the world gets more networked and smaller, people and even governments find ways to be able to work together to build value because traditionally the way that you build value has been through trade and through cooperation. So as that becomes more and more of an imperative in a world that is climate stressed, you know, I, I would hope that we find ways to, to cooperate. It just may be asymmetric cooperation. Uh, anybody else want to jump in on this thread? I apologize again, my connection. Yeah, was I was actually just going to add because they're Please. touching on it, but the there's a global ranking of soft power, which increasingly is what is, you know, sort of creating leadership among this community. Um, and the UK has um, consistently in the last couple of years been number two, the US number five, and China number 27. And I think that's important to note um, because... You know, 10 years ago, when I was living in the UK, someone said to me, for, the, for China, the US is their university, Europe is their museum, and Africa is their mine. And I sort of chuckled and thought, well, there's some truth to that. That's still true today. Um, but I do think it's worth noting that while they can rise in economic power, they are not choosing to lead um, in terms of the soft power. And I think that will have repercussions. Um, in in terms of sort of global global dominance, um, because they still use a heavy hand of coercion, um, and so uh, the, the the last piece uh, that I'll say on that is similar to uh, you know a workout regimen or wh whatever example you want to think of. What we're talking about here in terms of global challenges is not rocket science. We do know what we need to do. We just often choose not to do it. Uh, every one of us here can think of examples of what we can do individually or as a country or as a government to lead in this area, if we're just talking about climate, um, that um, that would make a meaningful difference. Uh, what's scary is that if we have children, now we're starting to think about the fact that, geez, the numbers they're projecting for where things fall off a cliff and have a significant impact on quality of life and human existence is uh, is within many of our lifetimes. Um, and that's, you know, and certainly in the lifetime of our children. So that's something that um, is, is hard to uh, not be a major motivating factor. I look, fully agree. And I want to add something to the monastery discussion, which I really like, Lord Way, you know, great example. I think the monasteries of today are probably the consumers. When we think that the power that individuals have to focus on one product versus another product, 
on one technology versus another technology. That can probably create more change, long-term change, than many other things. Um, and I think that's an area we need to we need to remember and we need to think how do we foster that as well. I think that waiting for Big Brother to fix it, particularly on the climate change, uh, climate uh, uh, side, when we're thinking about rewilding nature and many other areas, I think have shown how they failed. They are followers of the individuals. And I think we need to think how can we get the individuals to be the leaders again across social media, across maybe blockchain type uh, systems. But uh, using that power, any big power, any great power can fall pretty quickly if they don't listen to, to what's out there. Can I just come in here and... No, absolutely. I, 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 um, I would the, what you were saying. Felix, I'd love to stay with you and, and turn into the last section of the panel to spin things forward into the future. Your work these days is, ma- is helping is making bets on new frontier markets and uh, be curious to, to hear where more where, where there's new activity that maybe wouldn't be obvious to uh, to folks listening in. Uh, sure, and uh, Lord Way, apologies. I think we we'll just uh, cut you off there briefly. So uh, we'll yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, Lord Way. I, I, I weirdly enough, I just can't can't see or hear uh, your square, uh, but I'm just plowing through. <laughs> let, let me just uh, get to that, and maybe Lord Way can then uh, continue on the. Yes, uh, you please feel free to moderate it. And say, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, look, Zach. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Um, yes, look, I mentioned a couple of countries earlier already, so. We're focusing on where nobody else wants to focus on. And we think there's a, a number of real, true, hidden gems. Afghanistan, obviously, is a tricky one, but, you know, we're still the only ones investing there for profit commercially, trying to show that we can maybe do more for the development of a country like Afghanistan than a lot of the NGOs, uh, and there are literally thousands of them active in Afghanistan, put together. We'll see if we can improve that. Another country we're active in, and we find it super fascinating and also you know, very few people have listened and looked into that, is Uzbekistan. Old Soviet Republic, as some of you might remember, run by a, a brutal dictator for many years. Um, the daughter thought, oh, that's a nice one. Let me take a few billions out for me personally. Daddy died, daughter's in prison. And for the last three years, this country has really developed uh, in such a tremendous way with huge growth opportunities, regional connectivity, new infrastructure, and very few investors have looked into that yet. It's one of those hidden gems. Um, stock market is booming. Uh, there is a stock market. Many countries don't have that. New industry is booming. Mentioned Samsung earlier. So there are fascinating gems uh, out there that very few investors have looked into. And we think it's super interesting to, to focus on. That's just an, as an example. But Lord White, please, please continue on, on, your, on your previous thought. I think we have a connection uh, yeah. issue still. Yeah. Um, what I will say come from unexpected places, parts of societies that, that are untapped. And what we need to see is a new kind of village where still not just consumers, but people generally choose to connect, particularly those that disagree. So, uh, um, so I'll give you an example. So in the Northern Ireland example, we have a situation where blockchain could allow trade to happen between Ireland and the UK and Europe because blockchain is really good at tracking, you know, uh, where things have been and where they were made and so on and so forth. But what we need is people on either side as human beings, despite being in disagreement in, the, in a kind of village type kind of relationship to trust each other and work out how to solve this problem together. So I think the big solution we need is how do we re- rebuild those connections that have been ripped apart the last few years that the Internet was supposed to help facilitate, not just to buy and sell from each other as consumers, but to be people, to be prosumers, if we like. We create the value together. So I think that's all I'll say on that. But that's the big challenge. And, and, t- and things like the satellite technology that's coming will start to make that possible even between Afghanistan and the West. Right. The speed of the internet will allow these relationships to form if we want them to. 
just a small example, one of my technology investments in Afghanistan runs the largest uh, uh, um, uh, Ethiopian TV channel in real time from a playout center in a basement in Kabul via the cloud. You know, anything is possible, <laughs> just as an example. You know, Lord Way, you bring up a really good point, right? What we're looking at in the 21st century is we need revolutionary leadership that's going to help regalvanize community and heal humanity so that we can get back to many of the principles that you're talking about. So I 100% agree with you. As we get back to that local, you know, they call it the global type thing, right? These honeycomb societies, right? Obviously, Israel has been very good with it, with the kibbutz, with innovation, with a civil military fusion as well. I think you're spot on. You know, one area we haven't really talked about with regard to this topic is uh, the impact that AI is going to have over the next five years. Um, you know, AI systems are data hungry. And so the players, whether they're nation states or companies who have the largest uh, access to data sets, are going to be able to rewrite things on a horizontal level. So the last 20 years of technology have kind of been built in vertical winner-take-all silos. So you have a space winner or a car winner or a, a you know, taxi winner or an Airbnb-style hotel winner. And these are vertically oriented um, kind of consumer plays in the business world. But what we're seeing more and more with AI is the ability to cut horizontally across populations and be able to extrapolate insights and um, opportunities from that. And so I, when I think about things I worry about, um, I, I think that we're, we, we've seen evidence from China that the party is going to evolve into an AI. That's, that seems to be some of the strategy is to have a, an AI through Sesame and other uh, initiatives that is focused on loyalty. And then in the West, you have AI that is essentially optimized for making money. So you'll, you'll, you know, you're seeing op AIs that are optimized exactly toward that. Um, and then in, in Europe, there's kind of this idea of privacy or the person at the center of an existing, you know, strategy toward AI. Um, and when I say Europe, I'm still including the UK, even though we're post Brexit. Um, but, you know, this, this sense of privacy and the consumer at the focus of how AI develops. And so these are three very different AI oriented strategies, but they're fully horizontal and I think in the next five years, they're going to become very pervasive, really at the nation state level. And it's something that I think is going to be a really big indicator of who's powerful on the backside of that. Because getting the AI, like pervasive AI strategy right, I think is going to be very crucial to a lot of other things. And unfortunately, I don't think we're doing a good enough job um, in the West to prepare for that eventuality. agree with that uh, completely uh, and thank you for that stand and it, they'll leave that as the last uh, last point i apologize for i'm not sure if it was my technical difficulties or what have you there's no doubt that um the great powers of the next millennia will at least they will have figured out um video conferencing to uh to to work always reliably um this is fascinating panel. Really appreciate you all joining us. Thanks for this, you and the audience for, uh, for coming to listen. Uh, and I hope uh, everyone has a great rest of your day. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Great discussion. Thanks, everybody.